All right, so um, our second case, this is actually an image from the Super Bowl last year, if you guys remember. And for whatever reason there is, anytime I have case presentations for IBS, I usually choose a male, even though it's more common in females. So KS is a 32-year-old engineer um, sent for management of his IBSD symptoms, and he's had onset of symptoms for the past five years. He's in graduate school has had daily abdominal pain. Um, it's transient improvement after he has a bowel movement, but on some days and other days, he, his diarrhea causes him to have a lot of pain. On a typical days, he has two to three loose, watery bowel movements in the morning, and then one to two after lunch and dinner, and he has urgency. He says a bad day is when he has 15 to 20 urgent, non-bloody, small volume stools, and he has had some episodes of fecal incontinence, He's gained 10 pounds since the diagnosis, and his lab tests, including testing for celiac spruce, CBC, CMP, have all been negative on many occasions, and he had a colonoscopy a year ago also with random biopsies that was normal. Because of his persistent pain, he was worried that he may have cancer. He had a CT scan of his abdomen and pelvis, and they were all normal. He has tried loperamide in the past. He had tried fiber himself, peppermint oil capsules, dicyclamine, and antibiotics, and none of them have been effective. He had tried neomycin. He was offered rifaximin, but his insurance company denied it, which is often the case. <coughs> and his review systems is otherwise normal. No allergies, um, no medications now, except for sometimes he takes ibuprofen and acetaminophen. No alcohol use, no tobacco use. He admits to some anxiety. He's very worried about this. It has affected his quality of life. No surgeries before and no family history of celiac disease, any malignancies or IBD. So the key questions that this patient is asking is what's the cause of his abdominal pain? How can it be treated? So at this point, how many in the audience, how many people would do any further diagnostic testing? Is there anything else to test for at this point, right? Are we comfortable with the diagnosis of IBSD? Yes, I mean, he also had imaging, which some would argue may not be necessary, um, but that was also negative. And he's researched on the internet, and he wonders whether allocitron could be a good option for him. He asked whether other treatment options are available. So can we get a, uh, just raise your hands if you think allocitron can be tried? Very good. So let's talk about that. So again, what diagnostic studies do we need in patients who have IBSD? So for the most part, as far as IBD, colorectal cancer, thyroid problems, GI infections, these are not more common in patients with IBSD than the general population, or IBS in general. Celiac sprue in patients who have IBSD, although the prevalence is very low, is more common in patients with diarrhea predominant IBS, so that is something in a population, especially if there's a family history of celiac sprue, that we should check. So usually we check an IgA level, serum IgA level, to make sure they don't have IgA deficiency before we check tissue transglutaminase IgA. And then there's lactose intolerance. So that is obviously more common than irritable bowel syndrome would be. And that is easy to test just based on symptoms when they eat dairy products. That is also more common in patients with IBSD. These are some of the tests that are proposed. So CRP, fecal calprotectin, in patients, more likely if patients have had symptoms, if they have any alarm symptoms, and you want to find out before you do colonoscopy if the patient may have IBD, then calprotectin, fecal calprotectin can be helpful because it is a quantitative test. Again, we talked about celiac sprue. There are other tests that are available, um, but not in the United States, to check like a CCAT test to check bile acids. But the only thing that's more common as far as a colitis type of picture is microscopic colitis is more common in patients with diarrhea predominant IBS, and it's only if the patient's over 45 years of age. So it's not in the younger patient and not in our case. And then why is colonoscopy or imaging not recommended if they don't have alarm features? Again, for the same reason, because the only thing is microscopic colitis that you could miss. And then the most important, which as primary care physicians you guys already know, the most important for patients with IBS is that they see their primary care often. Thank you. Oh. That we identify their concerns, that we explain the basis for their symptoms, that we reassure patients, and we do a more cost-effective analysis so that 
so many testing is not done because that often is the case when they go to the ER especially, that we provide continuity and set realistic limits. Doing a colonoscopy has been studied in patients. It does not reassure patients in terms of their improvement in their health quality of life. And then this is based on an AGA survey. Um, they surveyed many patients, so this had over 3,000 patients with irritable bowel syndrome, and it was published in the, um, in the AGA. It was called IBS in America. And they asked patients what was most lacking in IBS treatment, and patients said that biomarkers to guide treatment was a problem, that the patient-physician communication, so that's where we come in, and then effective relief of their symptoms, which is an obvious one. So those were the top three. In terms of specific treatments that the patients, these patients had tried, most patients had been taking Imodium. So a lot of patients take Imodium, they take fiber, um, Pepto-Bismol actually was high up there, they try exercise, gas -X. FDA approved drugs are very low on this list. Um, and then patient satisfaction with certain treatments, the FDA approved drugs was number three. Taking Enterogam, which is an oral IgG for which um, I think all three of us agreed there's not great data, was number two on the list. And then taking other prescription medications was number one. Antispasmodics, Dr. Talia already talked about, so I'm gonna skim through this. Antidepressants in especially diarrhea-predominant IBS are very effective, tricyclics of what we try. We try this in low dose and then every month go up slowly. This does affect the visceral um, analgesia, it improves motility and smooth muscle relaxation. Peppermint oil, so this is a triple-coated um, peppermint oil for patients with IBS. Randomized controlled trials have been done with this with 180 milligrams three times a day versus placebo, and there is an improvement in the total IBS symptoms. The, what improves is the abdominal pain mostly, the bloating, and then the pain on evacuation, so not the frequency of symptoms. Now what about allocitron? So we talked about that in this patient. Um, you know, this is only FDA approved for use in females. So since our patient obviously is male, um, we would not be able to prescribe this because the studies were only done in females. But the FDA is very strict about this. And this is for severe IBS patients. This is a 5-HT3 antagonist. The regulations are due to the risk of constipation and ischemic colitis. That risk for constipation is about three out of one out of, sorry, one out of 3,000, and for ischemic colitis is one out of 1,000 patient years. It is a category B um, pregnancy, however, so it may be useful in pregnant patients. Um, okay, what about in the clinic? The dosage that you use is 0.5 twice a day for females. Again, chronic IBS symptoms. And there is a REMS program now that before you used to have to get a consent from the patient, you no longer have to do that. The acknowledge form is no longer necessary. It doesn't need a sticker on the prescription. You just have to um, educate the patient as far as what this drug could cause. So that is an option. Eloxadiline, Dr. Um, Lacey already talked about. We talked about the contraindications. And then this is just a summary for you guys to have as far as all of the efficacy of the IBSD therapies that summarizes Again, antispasmodics are very effective for the pain and the global symptoms. The number needed to treat was about six, um, but I would say that there are other side effects that are not so um, pleasant. Loperamide only helps the stool frequency. Antidepressants need to be combined with another medication so because they only help the pain, not the frequency of bowel movements. Probiotics help bloating and global symptoms, but they're not so helpful as far as stool frequency or pain. Rifaximin is very helpful for the global symptoms, pain, bloating, and stool consistency, but doesn't change stool frequency. Iloxadiline helps everything but bloating, and then peppermint oil helps pain, bloating, doesn't really change um, stool frequency very much. And bile acid sequestrants, they don't help with abdominal pain. So in a patient with severely, severe IBS symptoms, they probably would not be first choice.